So let's turn our attention to today's talk and our speaker, uh, Andrew Field. So Lieutenant Colonel retired, Andrew Field, retired from the British Army after a career spanning 43 years. He's been fascinated by the Napoleonic Wars for even longer and has spent many happy hours researching the period, visiting many of the major battlefields. He is considered as a leading expert on the Waterloo Campaign of 1815. He has a particular fascination for Napoleon's Grand Armée and boasts an extensive library of French memoirs and accounts of the Waterloo Campaign. He is the author of eight books, notable among which is a four-volume account of the 1815 campaign, which, by the way, are in my bookshelves, and, and I have read all of them. They're, they're amazing, uh, where he looks at the Waterloo from the French perspective based on the accounts of French officers and soldiers. He regularly lectures on Napoleonic themes, particularly on aspects of Waterloo, to a wide variety of audiences. He has also guided groups around the battlefield and key points of the campaign. He advises on several Waterloo projects, including what the Waterloo Remodeled and Waterloo Uncovered, and is currently advising on the redevelopment of the Hougoumont exhibition on the battlefield. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Field. Good afternoon, or should I say good morning. Um, it's a great honor to be here uh, and have the invitation to, uh, to talk to you all. Um, and as you can see from the, uh, the title there, I'm gonna talk um, about the Prince of Orange. Um, I wonder how much many of you know about the Prince of Orange, perhaps um, that he held some command at Waterloo, um, that he was wounded at that battle, and almost certainly, that he's generally described or portrayed, particularly in English histories, um, at least, as a rather uh, arrogant uh, and incompetent military commander. Well, is this all true? And that's, I hope, what I'm going to explore um, this morning. Well, nothing has done his reputation more damage, of course, uh, than this man. The character portraying him in uh, Bernard Corwell Sharp's Waterloo, in which uh, it's Sharp that shoots him to prevent him causing the deaths of, of any more British soldiers. In this novel, he's portrayed as a, a bumbling, incompetent, upper-class twit. And unfortunately, even in Bernard Cornwell's serious history of the battle, he's portrayed rather the same and referred to throughout rather irreverently as Slender Billy, his, uh, his nickname of the time. But even more serious British histories, uh, he, in, in which he's, he's portrayed as a, a grossly overpromoted and militarily inexperienced youth, whose incompetence uh, and lack of tactical understanding sent many soldiers uselessly to their deaths. So uh, my aim today is this, And just briefly, um, this is how I aim to uh, explore that, talk a little bit about his background, uh, talk about perhaps in a little bit more detail his early military career uh, as an aide-de-camp uh, to the Duke of Wellington in Spain. Then when he comes back from Spain at the end of 1813 to cover that period between uh, December and the start of the Waterloo campaign uh, in June 1815. Then we'll have a look in detail at what he got up to during that campaign, both at the Battle of Quatre Bras uh, and Waterloo, before really I'll, I'll have just very briefly go over uh, to what happened to him after, uh, after that battle, and then hopefully come to, to some conclusion. Okay, so let's have a look at his background first of all. You can see he was born uh, in December 1792, so he was not 23 at Waterloo, as many histories actually state, but actually only 22. Sorry, it was a lot of histories having 23 uh, at Waterloo, but actually he was only 22. But by then, he was already a, a full general in the British Army, although this is not particularly exceptional amongst the royalty and, and the nobility um, of that age. His father was this chap, Willem Frederick van Orange Nassau. He was the third son of the last stadtholder, Willem V, uh, who ruled the United Provinces before it was invaded by the French Revolutionary Armies uh, in 1795. 
after the French invasion, he lived in exile in Prussia, his wife was Prussian, uh, until invited to return to the Netherlands by the provisional government after its liberation by the Allies in 1813. He then became King Willem I of the Netherlands. Okay, so for the Prince of Orange, uh, under threat of the French invasion in 1794, uh, he moved to, first of all, to England and then to Prussia. And in 1805, he attended the Prussian Military Academy. Stayed there until 1809, when he was commissioned into the Prussian army when he was still only 16. Moved back to the United Kingdom, uh, attended Oxford University, where he studied law for two years. And that neatly takes us up to 1811, when he was commissioned into the British Army, as you can see, as a Lieutenant Colonel, not bad to, to start your military career as such, and in part for Spain. Um, he noted in his journal at the time, I have the honour of wearing for the first time the uniform of the first army in the world, hurrah, hurrah. Uh, in Spain, he was accompanied by his long-term mentor, Baron Constant Rebecca. Now, as many of you probably know, during the Waterloo campaign, Constant Rebeck was a quartermaster general, that is a, the chief of staff of the Netherlands army. Um, ironically enough, he started his military career in a Swiss regiment in French service, but he left in 1791 and entered the Dutch and then the Prussian army, where he became mentor uh, to the prince. In the memorandum on the Dutch army, believed to be written for Wellington, um, by Colonel Colborne, who was then military secretary to the Prince, it seems that he was well regarded uh, by the British senior officers. So let's now look at what he got to up to uh, in Spain. He uh, arrived on a Royal Navy ship uh, on the 21st of June, 1811. And in August of the same year, Wellington wrote back to Horse Guards the following. So what we have here is Wellington recommending that the Prince should join a brigade and that at that level he would start to really understand leadership on operations, perhaps also in, com in combat, and therefore he would build up his experience from the bottom as perhaps uh, he probably should have done. However, um, it didn't work out like that. Interestingly, uh, the prince turned that opportunity down. Um, and he rather volunteered to become an aide-de-camp um, to Wellington, perhaps to produce a, a rather more comfortable life for himself, but also to be close to uh, someone who was already establishing himself as a great captain. But even as an ADC, he was to see plenty of action in the two years that he served in the peninsula. So, the first same year, having been promoted full colonel, uh, he was action act, uh, present at the action of El Bowden. Um, and then in 1812, uh, he was at the siege of Cuidad Rodrigo, where he followed up the forlorn hope in the assault and was grazed by a ball uh, on a mission after the assault. At the storming of Badajoz, again, he was in the midst of the assault where he was noted encouraging the troops and also afterwards helped to carry the wounded to the rear. He was at the great victory of Salamanca and the abortive siege um, of Burgos. So he was accumulating a lot of campaign experience. He was seeing important battles and sieges from close, uh, at, close at hand. In 1813, uh, present at the, the great battle or the great British uh, victory at Vitoria, uh, the siege of, of San Sebastian, uh, the crossing of the Bidasoa, uh, and at the Battle of um, Nivelle. And uh, the action at Sororan, he had his horse shot from under him. So I think you can see here um, that not only did he see a lot of active service, um, but he was also quite close to the front lines at times. Uh, and I don't think anyone could accuse him of lacking, of lacking courage. Now, 
1813 approached uh, 1814, with the, 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 the campaigns that were being fought on mainland Europe, uh, the Netherlands uh, were being threatened by the Allies or the French forces in the Netherlands. Uh, and therefore he was very keen to get back uh, to sort of mainland Europe and to fight with the Prussians uh, against the French in order to liberate his own country. However, uh, the British turned that, um, that application down and we can only presume that this was because the British government wanted him to remain, if you like, within the British sphere of influence rather than the Prussian one. It was only at the very end of November 1813 uh, that he departed Spain uh, for Britain. So in summary, his time in Spain. Uh, First of all, um, we hear, well, we've already heard that Wellington recommended that he, he should be attached to brigade, sea warfare, perhaps a little bit closer uh, than he subsequently did. Um, having turned that down, however, he was he served as aide-de-camp uh, to Wellington for two years uh, of, um, of quite high pressure operations. Uh, during the time, he saw uh, plenty of action and gained operational experience. Um, and was praised uh, by Wellington in official dispatches, uh, for both for his courage uh, and for his intelligence. Uh, a British staff officer who worked in Wellington's headquarters in the Peninsula Road, he was generally considered a weak young man, but was not deficient in courage. And later, the same officer wrote, he became popular by his quiet and unassuming manners. Now, in 1812, so a year before he left the peninsula, um, Wellington wrote this. Sorry. Now, the medal that he was talking about um, was this one the Army Gold Medal. Um, and on the left there, you see the list, the list of actions that up until that time uh, he'd been present at. And each of these on the gold medal would have uh, acquired a clasp onto the medal, as you can see, uh, the one on the right, which obviously isn't his own one, but where you've got Toulouse and Orthez there, then he would have had the, the three battles uh, that, are, that are listed on, on the left. Um, however, just worth picking up something that Wellington wrote, and that was that actually the prince wasn't entitled to the medal because the medal was only awarded to field officers, that is, people of the rank uh, of major and above and general officers who had had successful commands in battle. And obviously, neither did he have a command and therefore he couldn't have been successful. So he wasn't actually qualified. Uh, however, um, not long afterwards, he got uh, a fourth battle, uh, which was Vittoria. And when, as a recipient of the gold medal, you had four actions, then you were awarded this medal. And that replaced the one that we've seen previously. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the, four, the battle honours were then engraved on each of the arms of the cross that we can, uh, we can see here. Um, and on the left now, you can see that there were further battle honours that the, where the, the prince served, and these would have been added as clasps to the ribbon. So he got this medal, even though he was not uh, entitled to it. Uh, but again, a little bit like his quick promotion, uh, these, this sort of thing was not uh, unusual for royalty or, or nobility um, at these times. So he was decorated. And in fact, the, the picture that you can see on the right there, you see him with his gold medal. But interestingly, um, none of the clasps. Um, and obviously, because he's uh, wearing the original gold medal, we can see that this was um, before the Battle of Vittoria, which would have qualified him uh, to wear uh, the cross rather than um, the actual gold medal. Um, so. Uh, Having been decorated, what we can see now also is he left Spain having acquired no command um, experience. OK, so that takes us up to um, this uh, next period. Uh, he returned to London uh, at the end of 1813 
um, and actually it was planned that he should get engaged to Princess Charlotte of Wales. Um, but this, for some reason, I haven't really got to the bottom of, um, it didn't work out. Uh, and so he moved from London um, back to the Netherlands. OK. Um, he arrived in The Hague uh, in December 1813, and he was immediately nominated as General of the Infantry in the Netherlands Service, uh, Inspector General of All Arms and the National Militia, uh, but also Major General in the British Army. As commander of the Dutch Field Army, he oversaw the final sieges um, in the Netherlands and Belgium uh, as the French were ejected early in 1814. Um, the following year, uh, he was nominated as Lieutenant General in the British Army. Again, bearing in mind at this stage, he was only 21. If only my own career had followed that path, um, I would be a happy man. Um, and uh, just a, a couple of days later, really, he was made commander of the British forces in Belgium. So here we have a young Dutch prince commanding the British forces um, in Belgium. Uh, so this was probably his first independent command, but of course at that time uh, there were no campaigns uh, running. So it was, if you like, very much a peacetime army with a small number of British troops that they had on the continent uh, at that time. However, just a month later, he was nominated full general in the British Army. So this is pretty good going from July to August. He went from Lieutenant General uh, to full general um, in the British Army, and he was commander of all the Allied forces um, in Belgium. So a pretty meteoric uh, rise, given that he was still only 21. In February 1815, uh, the Congress of Vienna established the Kingdom of the United Netherlands, incorporating Belgium, the United Provinces and the Bishopric of Liège under his father as King Willem I. And just two days later, because his father, who was up until that point, the sort of formal Prince of Orange, became king. And it was only at this stage um, that uh, Willem became officially uh, the Prince of Orange. And as such, he served really as a go-between between the British uh, and particularly between uh, Wellington and his father, because uh, Wellington and his father didn't go, get on particularly well. So it was very useful that the prince should know Wellington, having served with him in Spain, and he could, if you like, serve as the intermediary um, between the two. Now, just a tiny bit uh, of uh, history, just to clarify this last point. Um, after Napoleon's first abdication in 1814, the Congress of Vienna decided that the former United Provinces, what we tend to call um, uh, uh, Holland, uh, and the former Austrian Netherlands, which is better known as Belgium, should be joined into a single state under the rule of Willem uh, Frederick, uh, the prince's uh, father, who was, um, and this new state was to be called the United Kingdom of the Netherlands. Now, this was quite an interesting decision because the two states or the two former states had quite a long history as, as rivals um, and sometime enemies. Um, apart from their geography, uh, the Protestant, uh, Dutch speaking United Provinces and the Catholic, French and Walloon speaking former Austrian Netherlands made unlikely bedfellows and many Belgians, having lost their independence uh, in this um, move, were quite unhappy. Um, and Napoleon believed as a result that they were likely to change sides and, and join his army um, once the campaign opened. Um, indeed, many of the allied uh, commanders were suspicious uh, of the Belgian troops, um, wondering whether they would, uh, they were also worried that they would uh, change side. Now, Britain was the instigator uh, of this union. And perhaps this shouldn't be surprised um, because at the end of the day, what they were trying to ensure was that they had a friendly nation across the channel. And they were concerned that an independent Belgium may ally itself with France. Um, and so they identified that having a single friendly nation across the channel, uh, ruled eventually by the Prince of Orange, 
uh, so an old acquaintance of the Duke of Wellington, that this would help their own security. OK, so that, that little bit of history, um, let's move on. Um, so now we come uh, sort of back, if you like, to the 23rd of March, 1815, where he was nominated commander in chief, chief of the United Netherlands, of the troops in the United um, Netherlands. Um, now, uh, in this appointment, um, he was not regarded uh, very highly by many of the people who had known him as a colonel in the peninsula. Um, in April, uh, he was visited by General Roland Hill, who knew who had known him uh, from the peninsula. And Hill's ADC wrote this about the meeting. So it seems miraculously it turned from a fairly weak and, and quiet, almost shy officer in Spain to now as commander in chief. Uh, he had acquired a certain arrogance, perhaps with the, the strength, uh, the power of his new position might well have, uh, have gone to his, uh, might well have gone to his head. Um, so it's no surprise then that Britain sent a couple of trusted men uh, to keep an eye on him. Uh, and here we have them. Uh, General Clinton uh, was appointed as his second command, so second in command of the Allied Army, which was to become Wellington's army, and Colonel John Colborne, who was later famous for his command of the 52nd Light Infantry at, at Waterloo, was appointed as his military secretary. Now, neither of them had much good to say of the prince, um, but there is a danger, of course, that, we've, that they perhaps felt somewhat jealous of this young chap. Uh, who uh, was suddenly um, their, his, uh, their superior. Um, and in fact, Colborne wrote that he was not fit to command an, uh, an army. And Clinton also wrote his brother complaining that by promoting the prince to such a high rank, remember by this time he's a full uh, general in the, in the British army, it was difficult to reverse any unfortunate decisions uh, that he had made. And this is what he wrote. The impolicy of appointing so incompetent a person to the command of an army had now been made apparent. And having given the Prince of Orange the rank of general in our service, they cannot supersede him but by the person of Lord Wellington without displacing him. And so the army is exposed to all the danger of his inexperience. It is impossible for more to have been done to harass the troops to excite the contempt of officers and to destroy the confidences which all were first disposed to feel in the presence of our army. Our good fortune has been that the enemy has not been in a state to take advantage, advantage of our calamities and the arrival of the Duke of Wellington will be considered as now applying the remedy as if he was not the only general fit to command an army, but the only one capable of keeping it from falling into confusion. Now, after Napoleon's return from exile, the British government was also worried that the prince might make a rash decision and open the campaign early while he commanded um, the army. Uh, in his published correspondence, Colborne noted that the government wrote to him and, it's, uh, and he wrote, begging me to prevent the prince from engaging in any affair of his own before the combined operations. So probably much to his own relief, Colborne retook command of the 52nd in the middle of May 1815 in time for the Waterloo campaign. So on the 5th of May, 1815, so only just over a month um, before the campaign opened, Wellington was nominated as a Supreme Commander of the Army. Now, this is what the Prince of Orange wrote to Wellington. Now that's rather interesting um, and you can't help when you look at the bit I've highlighted in red, um, wondering whether he rather arrogantly believed that he was better qualified to command uh, the army than the many British generals who had fought, it, fought uh, and commanded at least divisions on the campaign uh, throughout the Peninsular War. 
Now, instead, the, the prince was nominated to command the first corps of Wellington's army. Now, this was quite a prestigious command. And as you can see, there were five divisions in total, uh, two British divisions on the left there, two British infantry divisions. And the first division was actually the Guards Division. So if you like, um, an elite division and the senior division um, in the army. There are also two uh, infantry uh, divisions from the Netherlands Army, the second and third divisions, and also the Netherlands Cavalry Division. So that was still quite a responsible command for someone uh, who was now uh, 22. Um, however, uh, it's true to say that Wellington generally didn't organize his armies into corps. They tended to organize them in, into divisions. And during this campaign, it seems as if the corps uh, was more of a sort of administrative uh, significance rather than a tactical significance. And Wellington's headquarters continued to give orders directly to the British divisions, uh, thus bypassing the prince's headquarters. Um, and there was always a danger that the prince was issuing orders as well as Wellington to the same divisions, perhaps to do different things. So uh, there was certainly plenty of potential uh, for confusion um, there. OK, so this map shows the concentration areas of the Prussian and Allied armies uh, at the opening of the campaign. Now, the dotted line towards the bottom, uh, and that is the border, the frontier uh, between um, France and the United uh, Netherlands. Um, here we see the concentration area of the Prince's First Corps. And this was, this turned out to be uh, the main uh, French advance uh, towards Brussels when the campaign actually opened. And actually, so the advance was screened there by the Prussian First Corps. So the Prussian First Corps were forward of the Netherlands or the Prince's um, First Corps. So it was them that came into contact first um, with the French. However, having had that initial encounter, the Prussians uh, withdrew uh, to the northeast uh, with the rest of the army in order to future, fight the future Battle of Ligny. But of course, what this did is it rather opened um, the French road, main axis, up towards Brussels. And the only troops um, that were on that main road uh, was a single brigade of Netherlands troops that were part of the 2nd Netherlands Division, part of the Prince's uh, First Corps. Now, when the Prince received uh, the information from the Prussians that the French were attacking up this road, uh, the first thing he did was jump on his horse and rush up to Brussels to inform the, uh, the Duke of Wellington. Now, I can't help thinking that perhaps uh, he'd have done better to send an aide de camp up to inform Wellington while he stayed with his corps, which was now exposed uh, to the French advance, uh, where he could make the decisions and redeploy his corps in order to meet the French advance. But he gave that up and moved up to Brussels himself. And when he got to Brussels, he passed on that information um, to Wellington. Um, but then, having delivered the information, he decided to stay in Brussels to attend um, the Duchess of Richmond's ball. Now, this is quite famous, of course, um, the night uh, before the Battle of Quatre of Bra. Um, and you'd have thought that perhaps, as I say, he should have returned to his headquarters, but he stayed um, for the ball. Um, and this, I think, was a bit of a dereliction of duty because as the campaign or as the French advanced, the Prince wasn't in his headquarters to make decisions. And therefore he sort of delegated, he delegated command of his corps to Constant Rebecca, who was his chief of staff and the commander of the second Netherlands Corps, uh, General Perponche. And it was them that decided to disobey the initial concentration orders, which had those troops concentrating at the town of Nivelle and actually to command the, to concentrate the division at the crossroads of Quatre Bras. So in direct con uh, contradiction to the orders that they, they had received. Now that decision really should have been the princes, but he wasn't there to make it. However, the following morning, first thing, the following morning, the morning of the 16th of June, the prince left Brussels and moved to join his troops that were deployed at Quatre Bras. 
Uh, and as I said, at that time, it was the second Netherlands division uh, that were deployed there. Um, so let's have a quick look um, at the, uh, the deployment um, there. Uh, what you can see there are the troops of the second Netherlands division. Um, and although this slide shows the, uh, the French advance, what I'm really using it to do is to show you the deployment that the, the prince uh, chose. Uh, the way that he deployed his troops. Um, and uh, so you can see that he had forward um, a screen of troops uh, and uh, quite a large reserve back around uh, the crossroads itself. You see that on the front uh, deployment that there are rather more battalions uh, in front of the Bosso Wood than there were covering the open ground to the right. I suspect there was a bit of the Prince of Orange trying to replicate uh, Wellington's positions there where he hid his troops uh, away from the French uh, to make it difficult for them to know where he was deployed. However, of course, in this particular case, half the battlefield to the right of the road that runs north south straight to the middle there was quite open ground. And of course, the French columns wanted to use this ground to advance rather than get sucked into close fighting in the Bossu wood. So although if you like, the Prince had the right idea, his deployment had some fundamental flaws. However, Wellington arrived before the battle broke out. He, wrote, he arrived at the battlefield about 10 a.m. and he was shown round the position um, by the Prince of Orange and stood on the heights at the very south of the map there, before the French had, had arrived, uh, looking down into the village of Fran, which was to the south, um, and few troops could be seen. So Wellington left Quatre Bras to go and meet with uh, Field Marshal Blücher, uh, the Prussian commander at Ligny, leaving the Prince in command, being fairly clear that the Prince was unlikely to be attacked and the French force was over facing the Prussians. So no uh, redeployment was suggested um, by Wellington. Um, so the mission of the Prince was to hold the, uh, the crossroads, the Quatre Bras crossroads, uh, and to wait there and to hold it until reinforcements uh, could arrive. Um, now, as I say, um, he deployed in such a way to have a screen forward and a strong reserve to the back. Um, the prince was heavily outnumbered. So instead of only a few French troops in front of him, what we found, what he found is himself, um, the whole of the, the French second corps advancing towards him. So he was outnumbered uh, well over two to one. He, at first he had no cavalry and very little artillery. The French were very strong in cavalry and very strong in artillery. So before Wellington was to return, the prince had a, a real battle on his hands. Um, the French, uh, as you can see there, they started their advance at two o'clock. The battle really opened at about 2.30. And seriously outnumbered, uh, he fought bravely against what was overwhelming numbers. However, when Wellington and the reinforcements, the expected reinforcements arrived, the battered Netherlands troops were withdrawn from the battle about four o'clock and they took no further part in that battle. So they fought really from about 2 to 2.30 up until four o'clock against overwhelming numbers. And by that time they were running short of artillery and were exhausted. Bearing in mind, most of them had very little uh, combat, previous combat experience or campaign experience. They had fought pretty well, but we shouldn't fool ourselves that it had always been entirely um, successful. Okay, but finally, um, just as uh, the, true, uh, the prince was, um, was facing defeat, um, British uh, and Brunswick reinforcements arrived uh, and with the appearance of Wellington as well, um, the French were held and eventually they were pushed back uh, to their start line. So let's have um, a quick look at the prince's battle. Well, he took a central part in commanding the Netherlands troops before Wellington returned, and he's described by a number of uh, first-hand accounts, getting around the battlefield, encouraging, motivating the troops, and leading counterattacks. So there's no doubt, as we've already said before, that he was a courageous um, young man. 
Uh, he was nearly captured during the battle uh, by a French of uh, a charge of French cavalry, in which one of his aides de camp were cut down um, and left for dead. So it's fair to say that the prince had a pretty good battle. Uh, his troops were led and inspired by him. They'd fought hard against superior numbers. Uh, and as I say, although not always entirely um, successfully. As the day drew to an end, uh, Marshal Ney, the French commander, in frustration, uh, ha having failed to uh, capture Quatre Bras, he ordered one last desperate gamble. He called for General Kellerman uh, and ordered him to charge the Allied line with his two regiments of cuirassiers. Ring there. Um, Kellerman ordered his men forward. Um, and at this time, the Allied deployment is shown uh, on the slide. And just to the east of the main road stood the 2nd Battalion of the 69th, the South Lincolns, which um, I've ringed there. Now, they were standing in line when they were warned of the approach of French cavalry. So the commanding officer ordered the battalion to form square. And it was just at this moment that the Prince of Orange arrived, bearing in mind that the 69th and that division were part of his command. However, the prince was unaware of the advance of these cuirassiers and he ordered them to move back into line. Well, of course, the Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 69th um, had no option um, but to obey. And as the 69th uh, moved from square, where in which they would have been pretty safe from the French cavalry, they moved back uh, into line. And as you can see there, well, one of the squadrons of cuirassiers seeing this English regiment in line, they swept or they wheeled uh, to the right and rode down um, the regiment, um, which resulted in the King's colour um, being captured. Now, the extent to which the Prince was responsible for this has been hotly debated because some of his supporters said that um, he wasn't aware of the French cavalry, no one pointed out to him, and so the order he gave uh, was quite a sensible one. Others say it was absolutely his fault. The CO had remonstrated with him and said uh, that there were cavalry coming and he'd ignored the advice and ordered them into, into line. But there's no doubt that he made a serious uh, error of judgment and that led to many deaths uh, within the 69th as well as um, the loss of the color. OK, well, on the morning of Waterloo, so this is now the morning of the 18th uh, and Wellington's army had withdrawn from Quatre Bar uh, back onto the main uh, position of Waterloo. Wellington, quite strangely, decided to reorganise his command structure. And the Prince of Orange lost command uh, of the First Corps and was retitled Commander of the Centre, as you see here. Well. We're not quite sure of the reason for this. This map shows um, Wellington's deployment at Waterloo. And what I've ringed there are the five divisions that we talked about that were part of the First Corps. And as you can see, they were spread across the whole front uh, of the battlefield. The Third Netherlands Division represented up in the top left-hand corner were actually off um, the map. Uh, that I've shown you there. And so clearly, because they were spread out, this wasn't uh, the command for a corps commander. You know, he wouldn't have been able to get around. He wouldn't have been able to synchronize the movements of his different uh, divisions. Uh, and therefore, he, um, he became uh, irrelevant to the first corps. And really, what had happened is Wellington had reverted to, to deploying his army by divisions and sending orders to them without having to go through uh, a corps command or a corps commander. Um, so that's quite an interesting uh, re, um, thing that Wellington did. And we can only really speculate as to why he chose to do this. Um, some people have said that it was a reflection of the prince's capabilities and that some of the mistakes that he made uh, at Quatre Bras forced Wellington uh, to do this. But at the end of the day, as commander of the centre, he still had a, a position of honour, really. But equally, uh, as Wellington spent most of the day um, near the crossroads there, uh, he was also in a position uh, to keep an eye on the uh, on the prince. Um, 
And so as we look at Waterloo, I'm not going to go through the, the phases of the battle, I think are pretty well known and don't really contribute um, to what I want to say. However, there are further failings that we saw, saw um, at Waterloo and are pretty well known. I just want to quickly um, have a look at those. Now, the best known probably of the, the Prince's battlefield faux, faux pas concerned this place, La Haye Saint, um, and it involved this man, Colonel Antida. He actually commanded, as you can see there, the second brigade of the King's German Legion. He was a very experienced officer who'd fought and commanded a battalion of the King's German Legion Brigade through the Peninsula uh, War. Um, now, he was deployed on the high ground um, above La Haye Saint. Um, and he was ordered to uh, advance the 5th um, King's German Le Legion Battalion, his old battalion, that because the French had captured La Haye Saint and his mission was to advance and to recapture it. Um, however, this order was given to him by General von Alten, who was the commander or the divisional commander of this particular uh, brigade. Now, Antida refused at first, stating that there were French cavalry hidden in the dead ground uh, and it'd be a suicide mission. And as soon as he advanced, he'd get ridden down by the cavalry. However, it was at this moment the Prince of Orange arrived. Um, the same discussion was had and he uh, reinforced uh, Van Alten's order and demanded that uh, Omtida carry out um, the attack that he was ordered to do. Um, although he was the brigade commander and not the battalion commander, he felt that it was a, a matter of honor really that he should lead that attack, which he, uh, he didn't uh, agree with. Um, so he moved forward with the 5th Battalion uh, and sure enough, um, the French cuirassiers, which were in the valley, uh, rode um, down the battalion. Um, a colour was lost from that battalion and the commanding officer was only able to rally 17 men um, of the whole battalion immediately after this attack. So that battalion had effectively been destroyed. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, this wasn't the first time in the battle that the prince had sent a battalion to its destruction. He'd already done it once before in almost identical circumstances. And this attack uh, involved um, the Lüneburg uh, Field um, Battalion. Um, at this time, La Haysan was surrounded on three sides um, by the French. And the Lüneburg Field Battalion were ordered to advance and to drive the French back from the farm. Now, the commanding officer of that battalion, Lieutenant Colonel von Klenker, he stated uh, after the battle that the order was delivered by an aide de camp of the Prince of Orange. Therefore, the order had come from the Prince of Orange. Now, the counterattack was launched in line uh, and was initially successful and pushed the French back. However, as the battalion got mixed up with the troops defending the farm, once again, they were charged. Uh, by French cuirassiers. Um, and during that uh, attack, uh, von Klinker, uh, the commanding officer, was wounded. Um, and the senior captain who was forced to take over was able to rally only 50 men uh, from well over 500 men that were in the battalion at the start. Um, and he was sent to the rear with those 50 men to try and find and scoop up uh, any other survivors and didn't return to the battle. So again, there was a battalion uh, that was lost uh, to the Allies um, relatively early um, within the battlefield. And the fact that this mistake was repeated later in the battle again, uh, we must conceive uh, as pretty uh, unforgivable. Now, after the report, sorry, after the, the capture of La Haye Saint, um, the French launched a, a cloud of, of skirmishers up onto the uh, onto the Allied line uh, and with a couple of artillery guns that were dragged forward brought the, the centre under command of the Prince of Orange under very close range fire and a number of battalions uh, became shaken and started um, to fall back. Now there was a danger 
uh, that the Allied center might break altogether. But the Prince of Orange, uh, showing undoubted courage once more, uh, was conspicuous in, in rallying um, the wavering battalions and then led them back uh, into the front line. And his courage uh, is mentioned by a number of eyewitnesses to this. Um, and here's one from uh, Captain von Skrieber, who commanded the Hanoverian Bremen Field Battalion. And he wrote um, uh, of the Prince as a battalion having been driven back from the front line. We were just in the process of reforming and had succeeded to some extent when His Royal Highness, the, the Crown Prince of the Netherlands, came up to us, praised the battalion's conduct and promised to remember us, but at the same time insisted on a quick advance. He would not even allow the completion of our reforming because, as he said, the enemy were already in disorder and had been beaten. Our brave troops, unformed, although compact, advanced again with the Prince at their head, shouting, long live the Prince of Orange. And of course, it was during this counterattack led by the Prince uh, that he was wounded. Now, in his Waterloo dispatch, Wellington wrote, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Orange, distinguished himself by his gallantry and conduct till he received a wound from a musket ball through the shoulder, which obliged him to leave the field. So it was at this point, uh, before the final attack of the Imperial Guard, that the battle was over for the Prince and he was sent uh, to the rear for, uh, to receive some, um, um, some care. Now his wound, uh, as well as a great victory of Waterloo, ensured that he was widely proclaimed as a hero in the Netherlands. But what did Wellington actually think of him? Now let's have a look at uh, some uh, dispatches that Wellington wrote uh, from Spain. Good education, very engaging, likable, but young, okay, we get that, very shy and diffident, not the uh, perhaps rather arrogant man that we met um, in 1815. First into the fire, so there's that courage that we've been talking about. Earned the respect and regard of the whole army and conducted himself with his usual gallantry and intelligence. However, we need to bear in mind that these were official reports and in those, Wellington was unlikely to be critical of someone that was going to rule a friendly nation. And of course, uh, Britain would have wanted as an ally. However, after Waterloo, Wellington's comments are rather more opaque uh, and less gushing. Um, later, uh, Wellington wrote uh, to the Prince, And I can't help but think an impression might be good, but perhaps it might be bad. And then later in a private conversation, uh, he spoke of his bravery, uh, but that perhaps were, was all that he had um, going to him. OK, so really, what happened to the prince after the battle? Well, um, in 1830, the Belgians revolted against their union. Um, with the Netherlands uh, and the Prince of Orange commanded the Dutch forces. However, um, with the support of the French and a French army, uh, the Belgians were able to defeat uh, the Netherlands and become once more an independent uh, nation. However, before that, um, he married uh, Anna Pavlovna of, of Russia in 1816, as you can see there. Um, he became King Willem II in the seventh, on the 7th of October 1840. And he proved to be actually quite an enlightened monarch, uh, essentially introducing a constitutional uh, monarchy um, to the Netherlands. However, uh, unfortunately, he only reigned uh, for nine years uh, as he died um, in 1849. Okay, so in conclusion then, um, in my presentation, I've tried to be as objective as possible by presenting the evidence, if you like, both for and against him as both a personality uh, and as a commander. Now, I'm sure many of you might feel I've been put, perhaps put too much emphasis on one extreme or the other. Um, 
for myself, I suppose I believe that the, the sort of designation of the prince um, as a, of a, as a, a useless uh, a zero rather than a hero is likely to be bedded perhaps more in folklore than in serious histories uh, of the um, of the campaigns in which he uh, he took part, uh, and perhaps rather um, people remember him or know him best um, for sort of Sharp's books, um, both um, fiction and fact. So let's um, quickly revisit um, the aim, and of course. If we could decide whether he's a, a hero or a zero, a lot depends on what your definition of hero is and what factors we should be considering. Uh, certainly he was painted as a hero in the Netherlands and you would have expected probably um, nothing else. But my aim suggests we should be looking to judge him perhaps on two different aspects, both his personality and as a military commander or as a leader. So let's have a look at these um, separately. First of all, as a, as a personality, well, I think we've already seen he was certainly a brave young man. Um, intelligent, that's mentioned so many times. Uh, he was obviously well educated, so I suspect that that's true too. Popular, again, perhaps not popular uh, before Waterloo as he commanded the Allied army, but certainly in the peninsula he was popular and certainly um, his performance on the battlefield of Waterloo uh, gave him some popularity, certainly amongst the Netherlands troops, perhaps not so much uh, through the Hanoverians um, that, that fought around uh, La Haye Sound. Well, as we've heard, he was described as quiet and unassuming in the peninsula, but also arrogant when he's back in the Netherlands in command of the army. And so I suspect that reflects uh, a growing up uh, and perhaps him feeling that in a position of authority, uh, he shouldn't be quite un unassuming. And I'm sure that he's probably uh, uh, right there. So if we forgive him the arrogance, perhaps uh, overall he's what the army would generally call a, a pretty good bloke. Now, as a military commander, uh, brave, uh, inspirational, certainly we've got plenty of ev evidence to support that, but certainly lacking in command experience. And I can't help thinking that he would have done better to accept uh, Wellington's recommendation to have served in a brigade uh, during the peninsula where he would really have seen uh, warfare close up and the command of troops uh, at the lower at the lower levels. Um, he showed clear tactical shortcomings, and that's probably because of that lack of experience. And so I think it's probably fair to say that he wasn't qualified for senior command in battle. Um, so I suppose my own conclusion, decent chap, indisputably courageous, uh, much operational experience, uh, but that lack of command experience at any level uh, made him unfit to command troops in the field. Now, no date, doubt. Um, many of you will have drawn your own conclusion. Um, and at that point, I rest my case. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, outstanding. Uh, I think Chris is busy gathering questions. Uh, there, there were a number starting to come in. Uh, perhaps you can stop sharing your screen and then that gives uh, everyone a chance to have a better look at, at you and your office there. So. Oh my, my goodness! Let me. Uh, you want me to? Um, uh, Let me see here. I can. Okay. Uh, probably somewhere up to the top, you'll see "Stop Sharing." There, there you we go. go. There you go. You. Yeah, but this is my little hideaway, my little study, um, with I suppose lots of prints and militaria, and you can't see my collection of books there or only the top of them um but yeah this i've got uh, quite a collection now i've got a little annex upstairs as well where i have to hide all the extra ones from uh, for my wife so she doesn't know how many I, i've been buying all right so uh ross flowers made a comment he he loved the photo you used uh, prompting questions uh, that was our brigade uh, at waterloo 2015 and you can see his drum corps featured prominently in the front so <laughs> yeah i did funnily enough i i did wonder when you were mentioning that um at the beginning uh, as to whether it was the same one that i was uh, that i was going to show on that last photo so i i'm rather pleased to know that it was yeah yeah you captured a, a good portion of the canadian brigade we we're in in and around the area of hugomal during the, the 2015 so all right chris take it away 
Thank you. I'm going to uh, jump in here. Uh, we've got sort of a wide variety of, of questions, some of them related more to the prince and his personality and some more um, towards his sort of tactical experience um, as you sort of separated near the end there. So I'm just going to start uh, sort of more on the on the tactical side. Um, do we have a lot of um, a lot of knowledge of the views of some of the senior Dutch figures about his ability on the battlefield? So uh, somebody mentioned uh, Rupek, uh, uh, Propolche, um, like these sort of uh, senior Dutch commanders. Did did they write on what how they felt about him? Um, no, they didn't. What I tried to do was to find all the references to the to here the to the prince that I could within uh, the British accounts with the British army that served he served with in the peninsula, and then of course when he took command in the Netherlands and and then during the um, and during the campaign itself. Um, and obviously those I've shared many of them with you, and those that I haven't shared pretty much said the same thing. Um, I I know I sort of avoided the question there, but I think the truth is, of course, that the senior um, Dutch commanders were were not going to say anything bad about their own prince and future king. Um, and so although the all the official reports uh, and the, the, the writings that I've seen uh, about the campaign from Constant Rebec, who kept a journal, uh, from Paponche, who obviously wrote his own report uh, of his division uh, at Waterloo. Um, and there's no mention of him. But of course, by commanding the centre of the army, that was, if you like, that was probably the Allied right centre. In other words, the Prince didn't command any troops to the other side, to the eastern side of the main road. His command, if you like, was to the west of, the, of that. And therefore, there were no, um, the only Dutch Belgian troops that were in that area were the cavalry who started at the back. And therefore, they were under the command of the uh, uh, Earl of Uxbridge, who commanded all the Allied cavalry. So actually, the um, the prince was not really seen by any of the, the Dutch senior commanders. Um, and therefore, they didn't really see what he did during the battle. Um, and I think it's fair to say they were unlikely to criticize him anyway. So unfortunately, I, I haven't seen anything that mentions him um, other than perhaps from other nations, um, such as the, the Nassau troops um, and some of the Hanoverian troops that he led in that counterattack, who spoke very, very highly of him um, and mainly, mainly of, of his courage. Right. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Naturally, you're not going <laughs> to criticize your future king. Um, there's, um, I, don't, I don't know uh, very much about uh, the current uh, British military doctrine. I'm sure you could uh, talk to us about that now. But I know that I'm the British military sort of ebbs and flows on, its, on this notion. But um, do you feel that um, the Prince of Orange would have been most effective if it just remained as a staff officer. It seemed like in the peninsula he was he was very effective of that. Was was that where his strength lay? Um, was sort of in, in more that role? Hmm. I mean, that, that's an interesting question because, of course, um, at the end of the day, that army was defending the new kingdom of the United Netherlands. And therefore, I think it was, again, important from a political aspect, if no, no other, that the prince should be seen to take a, a leading part in that. And I think Wellington was as much a, a political general as he was a sort of military general, if you see what I mean. So I'm sure he was pretty acutely aware that the prince needed to, to feature quite heavily in the battle. Um, and so I think that's um, probably the most important aspect or the most part of your question. I mean, interestingly, at Waterloo, the Dutch Belgians uh, fought in two deep line if we're talking about tactical doctrine. Of course, that was how the British had fought in uh, the peninsula, and that was the basis of their renowned firepower. Most other continental armies, in fact, all of the continental armies, fought in three deep line, and the reason for that was to add an extra little bit of security, a little bit of stiffening, so that the line wasn't too thin, so that if it broke, it broke up. 
Um, and so I think that the reason that the, the Netherlands troops fought in two deep line was because their commander in chief, the, uh, the Prince of Orange decided that this was a good thing. He'd seen it work in the peninsula and therefore he wanted his own troops to use it against the French to try and maximize the firepower. What's interesting is that the troops of Bilan's brigade, which were broken uh, during the battle by Durlong's attack um, to the east of the main road, they opened fire in two ranks and they blame that on the reason why they were broken. And they say that by having only a two deep line that their firepower was undermined rather than strengthened. And that is why the French were able to overpower them. So there's an interesting contrast there um, in views. Um, so it's quite clear, though, that the prince had influenced the, the tactical doctrine of the Netherlands army. Fascinating. Um, quickly, if uh, a few um, sort of short questions, if I if I can, um, when the uh, when the Prince of Orange, oh, sorry, before he was the Prince of Orange, uh, when he was first initially appointed as a Lieutenant Colonel in the British Army, was he attached to a regiment? No. I mean, he, he, I am presuming from what Wellington wrote about him perhaps serving in a brigade rather than as, a, as, a, as an aide-de-camp, um, that it hadn't been decided what he should do when he was sent out to Spain. Um, but of course, he, I suspect he will have gone out as a staff officer and therefore didn't have a regimental affiliation. Um, and that's probably the reason why he was promoted quite quickly from lieutenant colonel to colonel. Because, of course, once you get to colonel, really, you generally no longer commanded a battalion. That was normally a lieutenant colonel's job. So I think that the, the prince having turned down the option of serving in a brigade, he was promoted and, and then served throughout um, as a staff officer in the uniform of the picture that I showed of him um, with his medal, his gold medal on was a, a staff officer's um, a staff officer's uniform. So I'm sure that that's what he would have uh, worn uh, for the two years that he was out in Spain. Right. Um, and. Uh, you mentioned sort of his meteoric rise and, and certainly his uh, his promotion from um, lieutenant general to, to full general was was sort of absurdly fast. But I wonder, is there um, do you have any knowledge of sort of uh, perhaps the the British uh, George the Third sons, for example, um, and as would they rise through the ranks in a similar fashion? W was it sort of a royalty thing, or was this very unique? I think. I, I think it wasn't unusual for um, certainly royalty to be given what we would call honorary rank. In other words, they, they were generals, but they didn't they were never <laughs> intended to command anything. Obviously, some uh, families within royal royal families around uh, the whole of Europe would um, would serve in the army and work their way up. But they would start as a fairly junior officer so they could learn their their job properly. Um, and so, yes, they probably got up to to general quicker than perhaps most of their contemporaries uh, because of their royalty. But they actually had done, um, you know, they had been out on the battlefield and, and earned their stripes, so to speak. I believe that for the for the Prince of Orange, the decision by the British to promote him quickly was so that he had senior rank to any of the senior British generals. So he would. Um, have that seniority over them through rank so that the senior British generals who were major generals or lieutenant generals or even full, uh, uh, so no, so either major generals or lieutenant generals, they were not as senior in rank to him as a full general. So I'm pretty sure that the decision had been made that until Wellington took over, he would command the army, but to give him the authority in order to do that, they needed to promote him above the serving major and lieutenant generals in the British Army. So it all comes back to political decisions again in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I think one final question, um, which is uh, maybe outside your area of expertise, but uh, one, of, uh, one of our reenactor friends is a dancer. 
And so she she talks about um, I think it's David Miller's book who talks about the Duchess of Richmond's ball um, the night before Quatre Bras, and in it he describes um, the Prince as the Prince of Oranges um, as dancing and practicing dancing. Do you know was he an accomplished dancer? Did he did he enjoy it? Was it was that one of his his uh, favorite things in the in the military? As you suspected. Uh, Christopher, I cannot answer that question. Uh, I'm not sure about his ability at, at dancing, but I, but in a funny sort of way, the hearing what was written about him just underlines for me the fact that he wanted to be at that ball rather than commanding his corps on the frontiers, which the French army had just crossed. Um, so, uh, so I'm afraid I can't answer the question, but it, it does reinforce my army that he was in the wrong place. <laughs> well, I think the yes, answer... absolutely. And... Sorry, Tom. Oh, I was going to say that I think the answer showed up in the chat. Where, where uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Linda. I think under Nathaniel's uh, name says that one of the duties of Wellington's aide de camp was to shine socially, so he would have been expected to dance well. So. Well, I, all I would say there, he was no longer an aide de camp. He was a corps commander. Uh, but he had that he had that in his background, so I would assume within his skill set. <laughs> so. All right, thank you for uh, for hosting that part of it, Chris and Andrew. Thank you for the the fascinating talk. Lots of favorable comments in, in the chat. Uh, I think you helped us advance our day very nicely uh, for our viewing audience. I will um, try to find a, a link to Andrew's books and, and I'll put that in, in the description on the YouTube channel so you can come back to there. Uh, Hey, we're back at one o'clock Eastern. So join us live or watch the recordings. If you missed Beatrice's talk to open this morning, uh, you can go back and, and watch the recording on our channel as well. And uh, please remember our, our one small ask or favor, if you could subscribe to our channel.